Well, this morning we're going to look at uh, Genesis, uh, some of the things that are written in the first three chapters of the book of the Bible, Genesis. If these uh, early understandings are not um, a part of our mind and our mindset when reading the Bible, we're not going to understand the Bible. For that matter, if we don't understand the truths that are set forth here in the beginning of the book, you're not going to understand a lot of what's going on in your own personal life. So it's, it's very important inf information. And there's uh, six points that I want to cover with you this morning. Uh, the first one is, what, was, what is the purpose of creation? Then the next one is, why the tree? That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why the serpent? What happened with Adam and Eve? what died that day, and what is the purpose of the ages. In order to do this, I'd like to begin in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse um, 26. This is after, again, I'm, I'm going to, because there's a brevity of time, I'm not going to cover the, in detail these three chapters, but prior to what we're going to read in verse 26, everything else in creation is set in place. The last thing that, that is recorded as far as what God created was humanity and and the leaning that we're given or the understanding that we're given is that all of creation was leading to the creation of man and that the reason that uh, God set everything up in the order that he did and it all gives evidence of his great love his great concern for humanity and uh, the reason for all of it his crowning accomplishment was the creation of man and uh, in verse 26 then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the, over the birds, over the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So he created this whole thing, the earth and all that's within it. And then he gave man uh, authority over it for man to enjoy it and take responsibility of stewardship of it. It says that, we, that man was created in God's image. And, um, and then, he was, then it says that man was to reproduce and fill the whole earth with people that were like him. And in, in this understanding of these, these, these few verses, we, we can garner an understanding of the purpose of creation. Why did God create humanity? He created humanity, as again, it says it here, and it, throughout the scriptures, reiterates it, he created re humanity because he wanted to have a love relationship with humanity. He wanted to have a real, personal, love, everlasting love relationship with mankind. He wanted to be a father with a, with a family, a family that would reciprocate his love for them with love for him. Hence, he created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them, man and female. And, and the reason that he did this is because it gave them the ability to love God like he loved them. Perhaps the, uh, as I've thought of this, uh, there's so many um, different ways of viewing what the image of God is. But as the context will reveal, the, the primary image of God that stands out is that God created them to be holy like he himself is holy. God is holy, holy, holy. And he created man and woman to be holy so that they could have this wonderful relationship with him. So the purpose of creation, the purpose of creation wasn't just man. The purpose of creation was so that man could be loved by God and that would, he would in return love God. So if you, if you, if you, why am I here? Why was I created? The reason is, is so that you would love God and be loved by God. Uh, then uh, in, in chapter 2, verse 9, 
we see, of course, uh, the, the other point before I move on to is that he said to, he said to Adam and Eve, I want you to fill the whole earth with people like you, people that were created in the image of God. Now, holiness is not the only thing. They had love and they had righteousness. They were free from sin. They were very much like God in many ways. Uh, but the, the way in which they were most like God was the way in which they could love God like he loved them. And he wanted the whole world. He wanted a whole world filled with people that were created in his image. <laughs> Obviously, we have a deviation in that. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 9, he says, Out of the ground the Lord God caused the ground, out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to sight and good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We have, I've talked about this recently, we have three trees that are in the garden. You have the tree that is very similar to the trees that we still have today, trees that have fruit on it for us to enjoy and that are pleasant to look at. And then we had, the, there was the tree of life and there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, from every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Well, again, I, like I, I started, I said there's six points that I want to make for you, and I want to say that having six points to any teaching is uh, risky. Usually you can cover three points with people, and some people one point, and some people don't get any of the points. But, uh, so but such, I have such a bright group here, I've decided to go with six points. The purpose of creation then is to have that love relationship with God. The next question then is why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You see, he gave them a choice. You can eat of the tree of life or you can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, so why would the tree of the knowledge of good and evil be there? Again, it's an, it, the way to interpret that and to understand it is to not forget what the first purpose of creation was, which was to have that love relationship with God. In order for there to be love, it's imperative that, that there is self-determination, that people had free will, that they could choose on their own to love God back. God did everything on his part to set it up to have this family relationship. He created the whole of the universe, placed man in this perfect environment called Eden, and gave him the, the enablements to love him. And now they had to make up their mind that they wanted to participate in this relationship. They had to choose. And if the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not there, there really wouldn't have been a choice. It gave them the opportunity to decide. And fundamental to understanding the core of love, well, the core of love is self-determination, free will. And at the core of, 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 also at the core of love and understanding love is, if you love me, obey my commandments. If you will love me, obey my commandments. There is this immutable relationship between obedience and love. They're never to be separated if we're, going to have, if we're going to have love for God, what corresponds always with that is obedience to God. And that's what he set before them with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They had the choice whether they were going to obey God and in doing that love God or disobey God and in doing that, the scriptures later on call it hate God or reject God. We see that this free will is fundamental not only to Adam and Eve, but it's fundamental to... Um, to cherubim and to angels, spirit beings. They also have free will, self-determination. The cherubim have the choice, they have free will, and so do angels and so do humans. It's an important part of the way that God created. It was a part of his creation. And woe is any of us to judge how God created things. He, he knew that he didn't want robots. He wanted people who had 
the ability and the, uh, and the desire to choose to have him in their lives. Hence, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the next question is, why the serpent? In chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, God has said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden. Now the serpent, and I, I'd like to show you this from the scriptures where it talks about the certain so we're, serpent so we're clear as to who he is and how he got there. In Revelation chapter 12, and I know you can find the book of Revelation quickly unless you have a phone. It's uh, the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse Nine. The great dragon was thrown down. Twelve nine. The serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. So the serpent of old, as we're reading the serpent, he is the devil. He is Satan. That's who the serpent was. So please turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. You have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel 28. Following Ezekiel is Daniel. Ezekiel 28 is where we get the understanding of what was the serpent doing in the garden? Why was he there? Here in this chapter of the 28th, 28th of Ezekiel, God is making a comparison with the king of Tyre and the devil, the serpent. It says in 28.12, the son of man take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. And now he starts talking about not the king of Tyre, but he starts talking about which we will see is this cherub who is the serpent that was in Eden. And, uh, and he's comparing the king of Tyre to him. Thus says the Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. For you were in Eden, the garden of God. Now the king of Tyre was not in Eden the garden of God. God. We can, we can, I can tell you this from the, the first three chapters. We'll see it that the players that are there, the, the beings that are in the garden is God, um, Adam and Eve, and cherubim and the serpent. That's all that are there. The king of, there's no king of Tyre hanging around in the garden of Eden. Uh, so... You were in Eden, the garden of God, verse 13. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, and so on it goes. And gold and workmanship of your settings and your sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. It's a, it's a figurative way for us to understand what the spirit being was, was about. He was using all of the precious jewels or, or stones that are available for us to understand, he was absolutely beautiful. He was perfect. Made, you know, and we can liken it to all these, these precious stones. He was precious. He was beautiful. He was perfect. As a matter of fact, it will say that. God created him such. On that day, you were created the, this, this being didn't exist always. It was created by God. They were prepared. Verse 14, they were the anointed, you were the anointed cherub who covers. And the place, and I placed you there. You were in, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. What was he doing there? He was placed there by God as a cherub, not as a serpent. He was placed there as a cherub, full of wisdom and beauty and purity and like God. 
And, and he was placed there by God in the garden. And it says in verse 15, you were blameless in all your ways. He was blameless. There was no sin in him when he was placed in the garden. For the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as profane from the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You, corrupt your, you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. I apparently skipped something. Verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. That's the part that I skipped. It's kind of important. You were the anointed cherub who covers. He was placed there by God as the anointed cherub who covers. Now, what are cherubs? Well, the plural of cherubs is cherubim. The other place, the first place that we're talked about where it's very clear when we're talking about that is the two cherubim that are set at the garden after the fall guarding the tree of life so that Adam and Eve cannot eat thereof. They're set there to guard the tree of life. This cherub was sent in Eden. He was placed in Eden to cover it, to guard over it, to protect it. That's why he was there. He wasn't there to be a serpent. He wasn't there to rebel against God and against humanity. He was there as a representative of, of God to watch over this creation and the created ones, Adam and Eve. But he was lifted up with his pride and his beauty and decided to um, rebel against God. See, he had free will just like Adam and Eve had free will. The other place it talks about cherubim is in, in, in uh, the beginning chapters of Ezekiel, the very book we're in right now. It talks about there being four cherubim that are upholding the throne of God. They have four faces, these cherubim. One is an eagle, one is a bull, one is a lion, one is a man. And they, they, they have four faces, one on each side. So it depends on which way they're looking, which one is seen. And they have eyes all around them. They're very odd-looking creatures. But they are, they are the closest beings to God. They are uplifting, in, in Ezekiel, they're uplifting the throne of God and moving it for him. The other place that cherubim had talked about are in the book of Revelation. And it talks about them as being uh, the living creatures, it says in, in Revelation. It's a this similar description of them as is given in Ezekiel. And again, we see they are placed in a position where they're the closest living beings, save for Jesus, to God. And uh, that's, who the, that's who the serpent was before he fell. Now, while he's in the garden, apparently, now again, he's not placed in the garden as the serpent. He's placed in the garden as the cherub. So the serpent didn't live centuries before Adam and Eve were born. He wasn't created in some other time and some other sphere. He was, he was in the garden, and when he decided to rebel against God, which, which go back to Genesis, may be the very record that we're reading, because that's the information that's given to us. It isn't until after this time, did you get what I just said? He became, in Eden, he became the serpent. And he could have, the, the very issue that made him, or, you know, where he decided the turning point was this manipulation with Eve and Adam. He tried to steal away from God the purpose of creation. The purpose of creation was humanity's loving relationship with God. And what he's messing with is the very people that he was there sent to guard over, he's now tempting them to rebel against God just like he himself was doing at that time. He didn't get cursed 
until after the fall, which makes me think that this is the first rebellion of his is dealing with Adam and Eve. It's after that that he is the cursed one. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. So that's why the serpent was there. Again, like Adam and Eve, he had self-determination, free will, and he decided to rebel against God and be disobedient. In addition to him, you can go back and read Revelation 12 again, you'll see that one-third of the angels decided to side with him. One-third of the angels also exercised their self-determination, their free will, and rebelled against God. And hence began what has been going on ever since, the war, the spiritual warfare that is, you know, going on. Something that so few of us think about, and all of us should never forget, that there is a serpent who is called Satan and the devil, and that he is manipulating one-third of the angels of heaven against the angels of God and against God and against you and me. And in the balance, it was always about humanity. The worship of humanity, taking them away from that love relationship with God, bringing them into a love relationship with the serpent. This is sort of a silly illustration, but I thought of this, something I learned many years ago. So bear with me here. That, that uh, you know, uh, as humans, we're concerned about having bad breath. That's something that uh, is common to all of us. And that's why the advertisers, they, they advertise all these different kinds of toothpaste and all these different kinds of toothbrushes. And you can buy all these different kinds of mouthwash and all the other ways to deal with bad breath. And, uh, and you know, we try a lot of them. Some, some of us have even tried pulling out all of our teeth to see if that would work. I'm not going to mention any names on that one. But... Um, the fact of the matter is, bad breath is not, is not a, you don't get rid of it by putting paste on top of it. It doesn't eliminate it. It does for a little bit of time, but it doesn't go away. As soon as the, the taste of the toothpaste is gone, your bad breath comes back because the cause has not been dealt with. The cause is, if this is a tooth, if my fist is a tooth, around each one of your teeth are your gums. And in between where the gums are and the, and the tooth are, there is a valley. And in there, there is germs. And if those germs, that's where the odor comes from. And if you don't eliminate those germs, then you're not going to get rid of bad breath. The way you eliminate those germs is you floss. You wrap the floss around your tooth. You slide it down in between your gum and your tooth. And then you pull it back up and it disturbs the germs and it eliminates bad breath for the day. And then you got to do it again tomorrow. And that's how you get rid of bad breath. That and if you stop eating crap. <laughs> so we're probably not going to, the last one, eh, but the, the flossing is something that we can do. And that will eliminate the cause of the problem. I told you it was an odd illustration. All right. But it's, it's one that I believe to be true. It's something I learned many years ago, and I think it's right. Um, now, a lot of people, when they floss, they floss the wrong way. They don't wrap it around their tooth and then slide it down to get it. They, they just come down on their gum. That's not it. You've got to get it between the gum and the tooth. And then you can eliminate bad breath. You're dealing with the cause then. Well, the cause that of our problems in life are spiritual. The cause, of, the cause of all the evil and the killing and the destroying that's going on is there's a spiritual warfare going on. We see in the beginning pages of the book, and we need to continue to understand that as we go through the book. The serpent, in chapter 3, who had bad breath. In, in uh, chapter 3, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Is that what God said? No. 
verse 17, verse 16, the Lord God commanded, of chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Now everybody is thinking to them, do I have bad breath? Let's go back and focus on this. <laughs> um, and he lied to the woman. Indeed, or look what he says. Indeed, God has said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. He got right away. He, he sort of sets it up. He, he, here's what he does. He messes with the integrity of God's word. Vital importance. God was very specific. He was very clear. He said, you can eat of all the trees you want, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat thereof, for in the day you do, you shall surely die. And now he's saying, you shall not eat from any of the tree of the garden. He's, he's changing what God said. He's de diminishing the significance of God's words and changing them around, baiting Eve to do the same. In verse 2, that's exactly what happens. The woman says to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it. Or what? Did God say anything about touching it? No. She's now adding to it. She's changing what God said. And here's the facts, whether you like it or not. Here's, here's the reality. If you want the Word of God, it has to be 100% accurate. I mean, you know, 99, let me say it a different way. 99% truth is still not the truth. It's no more the truth than 99% of a lie. It's got to be 100% of the truth. You can't change a word, add a word, and do all the rest. And by God, I tell you, when it comes to reading theology and the, all of the books about this original thing, it's amazing to me how much changing and adding is, is, is in there. For, for example, when it says, here's a, here's a very classic example, very commonly believed, that when it says we created man in our image, in our likeness, and where it uses the plural, us and our, people say, well, that's Jesus. They add that in that that's Jesus. Well, it doesn't say anything about Jesus. Actually, the word Jesus isn't even in the Bible until Matthew. Because he isn't born until it's recorded in Matthew. But people add that in. And if you add something in, you no longer have the Word of God. That's what Eve did. She added it in. Don't touch. She changed the integrity of the Word. That's always how the devil gets humanity to be disobedient to God. It's to put to put in our minds a doubt about his integrity. It goes on in verse 4, And the serpent said to the woman, You, shall, you surely will not die. No, verse 3, But the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's, he changes the whole thing around and says, look, you're not going to die. You're going to be just like God. And God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You will die that day. The devil said, you're not going to die, die because God knows that if you eat that from that tree, it's going to be better for you. You're going to be just like God. The, the thing is, she already was just like God. <laughs> she was created in the image of God, in His likeness. She wasn't God, but she was just like God in many ways. He lied. But you know, it's the same lie that you and I face all the time. The word of simple things the Word of God says. The Word of God says, don't lie. Well, you know, Generally, I don't lie. It's just this one little white lie so I can get out of this situation. We, we rationalize to ourselves that, well, you know, this, this lie is acceptable. Because God didn't really mean don't lie. He meant don't lie most of the time. Just every once in a while you can tell a white lie. That's what we do. Or don't steal. Well, 
he, he wasn't talking about taxes. He was talking about things. You know, it's all right to steal taxes because the government's stealing from us and they're pissing our money away. And, you know, we, we have this whole rationale in our minds as to why we should steal. I don't have to obey the laws of the land. I mean, wearing the seatbelt, I know somebody that died because they had the seatbelt on, so I'm not going to wear the seatbelt. And yet the Word of God says do what the government says to do unless it's contrary to the scriptures. You see, we, we rationalize and then we decide to disobey. Don't work, it says. If you don't work, you don't eat. I see plenty of people not working that are pretty stout. <laughs> we think that if, we think the, the deception is, is that God really doesn't mean what he says. That there's a, you know, there's a loophole. And that's what happened here. God knows that in the day you eat there, it's going to be better for you to disobey God than it is for you to obey God. That's the bottom line lie. That's what happened. She believed that God didn't have integrity about his words. She didn't, she didn't believe that God meant what he said and said what he meant. And because of that, um, she ate of the fruit. And let's say that in verse 6, And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also it to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of them both were open. So going back up here to my little chart, the purpose of creation is for, for mankind to be in that love relationship with God. Why the tree? It had everything to do with Free will and free will has everything to do with whether or not we really love because love is rooted and connected to obedience. Why the serpent? Well, God certainly didn't place the serpent there because he wanted to tempt people. God didn't place a, ser a serpent in Eden, actually just the opposite. He placed a cherub in Eden that was going to protect man and work with him. And then what happened? What happened was is that Eve believed the devil and his lies about God and, and she believed she didn't believe the word bottom line she didn't believe the word so the question then is what died that day because you know you read in I think it's in Genesis 5 5 you read that Adam went on to live 930 years after this so he didn't die that day so what died that day I I, I you know, I guess, verse 7, the eyes of them both of them were open and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves a loin coverings. Look at chapter 2, verse 25. The man and his wife were both naked and they were unashamed. So before the fall, they were naked and unashamed. After they ate the fruit, post the fall, the eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. There's a change in how they're thinking about their nakedness. Before the fall, there was no shame. After the fall, there's this uncomfortability that has to do with shame. So what changed? What changed was, and as we'll continue to go on, we'll see that their behavior radically changed. Well, what happened? What was the cause of their change? You know, what, was, what, what were the germs around the, the gums or in their gums? What was the real cause? Well, the cause was they lost that element of their original creation, that part where they were created in the image of God. It was, either, it was either diminished greatly or totally lost. The holiness, the purity, the innocence, what is later on in the Bible called the divine nature, that's what was lost that day. Now some say it was the spirit, some say it was this, some say it was that bottom line there, that, that, that element that put them into a relationship with God. The, what, here's what changed. Everybody, here's what changed. The purpose, 
the very purpose for their existence, the purpose of, of, of all mankind's existence is a love relationship with God. That is what changed. The element that gave them the ability to have that relationship with God was diminished or completely destroyed. Now, instead of having clean, holy, pure minds, their own nakedness, the nakedness between this man and his wife became a problem. That's not a problem if your mind's holy, if your mind's pure, if your mind's innocent, if you're doing what's right and just before the Lord. Nakedness has been a problem ever since for humanity, for adults. It's not so much for kids, little kids. They don't care so much about nakedness. You know why? Their minds are not, they haven't matured enough to, you know, they have the innocence that we lose as we mature. So what died that day was the very thing that God put in them so that they could fulfill the purpose of the ages or the purpose of creation, which was to have that love relationship with God. Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God from among the trees of the garden. Quite contrary to the to the freedom that they would have enjoyed on the other side of the fall where they had this free, open, loving relationship with God. Now they're afraid of God. They're hiding from Him. The Lord God called to the man and He said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now, That beautiful love relationship that they enjoyed has been diminished significantly to the point of where they're afraid of God and they're hiding from God. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which which I commanded you not to eat? Now, obviously, all of us can figure out that God knew where he was and knew what had happened. Um, Or, you know, he says to him, You know, he asked him a question. Well, why did he ask him a question? He gave Adam the opportunity. Adam had the opportunity with that question to say, yes, I ate of the tree. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It gave him, it afforded him an opportunity that he wouldn't otherwise have. He didn't immediately condemn him. He said to him, again, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to? And of course, the man blames the woman. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave gave me from the tree and I did eat. What would have happened if he would have said, yeah, I did eat. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. We'll never know. Then God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said to the serpent, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So right away we see that there's a radical change in their behavior. And unfortunate, the unfortunate reality, it goes on in Genesis chapter 5, I think it is, and says that all of those who are descendants of Adam and Eve, which is all of humanity, they are our parents, were all born not in the image of God, We're born in the image of Adam and Eve in their fallen state. We have this intuitively, or I don't know about intuitively, you know, uh, what do they say? Uh, It's human nature. That's it. It's human nature. It's human nature to be afraid of God, to hide from God. It's human nature to blame somebody else, to shift the blame. It's human nature not to accept responsibility for the wrongs that we do. It's human nature to be disobedient to the commands of God. The Lord God said to the woman, verse 14, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. We discussed this at our noon fellowship. We have a Wednesday noon fellowship. We happen to be studying Genesis and... and, uh, we discussed this, 
What I, what I said to you earlier is that the cherubim, the cherubim were the closest living beings to God. They were in this exalted position, and the four of them still are, around the throne room of God. The only one closer to God than the cherubim now, today, is the resurrected Jesus. He sits at God's right hand. But after them is these four living creatures. So this cherub who turned into the serpent, he was at the most exalted position in the universe, in God's creation. He was at, you know, he was in God's presence. Now, what we see here, reading this, obviously some of it's figurative language you're talking about, and, but what you, the point you get is, he's now the lowest of the lowest of God's creation. You can't get any lower than he is. He's going to be on his belly and squirming and eating of the dust of the ground. He's gone from that highly exalted position to that lowliest of the low position. That's where the serpent is now. Verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now we know as the scriptures develop that this is, this is prophecy about, the first prophecy in the Bible about the Messiah. That there is going to be a woman, a, a child born of a woman, of the seed of the woman, that is going to destroy the devil. Here we see the beginning of the rest of the Bible. Now, the storyline of the Bible through the Old Testament is following the seed of the woman, which we know from in Genesis chapter 12, it starts talking about Abraham and from Abraham to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob. Jacob becomes the 12 tribes of Israel and so on it goes until we get to Jesus. So from this point on, we now, we're not talking now about the pur purpose of creation. We're now talking about the purpose of the ages, which is a regeneration, a new creation. The, the purpose of the ages from this day forward would be that the Redeemer would come and bring back that which was taken away from God, him, people, humanity, so that we, in the end, would go back to Eden and go back to the original plan or purpose of creation. So now the purpose through the ages is to get back to that, and that's what Jesus is all about. So the purpose of creation was a love relationship with humanity. The tree was there so that we could exercise freedom of will. Why the, why the serpent? I, don't, I certainly do not believe, I don't believe that the scriptures support the thought that is commonly believed in society today, which is God knew that the serpent was going to do this. God knew that Adam and Eve was going to sin. God knew, I don't believe that. I don't think it says that. Actually, it applies to me that, well, if God knew that, then why would he do it? You know, and, and I, I don't think that, the, that doesn't say that. It doesn't say he did know. It doesn't say he doesn't know. I'm saying don't read into it one way or the other. Uh, but the serpent was there. He was not there. By, he wasn't placed there by God to be a serpent. He was placed there by God to be the cherub that covers. What happened? Adam and Eve didn't believe the integrity of God's word. What died? The essence of humanity died. The the the, the, most, the reason for our existence, that's why everyone today struggles because there's that void within humanity. What everybody is looking to have filled is that thing that was lost back then, which is that love relationship with God. And for those of us who are Christians, and when we accept the Lordship of Christ, we, we have at least in part a, a, you know, a respite from the insanity where we have, we're able to have this love relationship with God. And as a Christian, when you're in fellowship and you're doing well and you're living in love with God and you're loving your fellow man, everything's good. You got love, you got joy, you got peace. And then when you screw up and you sin and you drift away from God, you're right back to where you were before. 
you got that void inside you. The void is for that love relationship with God. The centrality of God is what it's all about. And that only happens through the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then that's what died. So now we're back to the purpose of the ages is to get back to what God originally set up. I, I, I'd like to end by saying this to you about, uh, I was at a teaching last weekend or the weekend before. Was it last weekend? I was in Long Island. And it, was, it was the weekend before. And um, John McCabe did an excellent teaching talking about Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, as our Messiah. I've been talking primarily about God this morning, but, but Jesus is the way back to God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. And, and John illustrated something that was, has, has resonated in my heart ever since. He talked about different, the different ways in which the scriptures refer to Jesus. It refers to Jesus, it says that he is our friend. The relationship that one has with a friend, it, Jesus puts that forth as the relationship that we can have with him. He puts forth that the other relationship that we have with him is he's our brother. And the, the relationship that you have with a brother is different than the relationship that you have with a friend. There's a special uniqueness and closeness that, a, that brothers have that maybe friends don't have. And there's special things that friends have that brothers don't have. So it's two different intimate relationships. Then he puts forth that we are the bride and he is the bridegroom. Well, there's a whole different relationship that a husband and wife have than a brother has and a friend has. That intimate relationship is also used to describe our relationship with him. Then the other one is that he is the head, we are the body. Now, there's a, there's, you can't get any more of an intimate relationship than that. You know, it's not, you can't disconnect that. And that we have him inside of us. So every human relationship that you can think of that expresses closeness to another person is put forth to us so that we understand how close Christ is to us. He lives inside us. And he knows how to do this whole thing. He did it, and he did it perfectly. And he is there to help us to live this godly life so that we don't have to get deceived like Eve was by the serpent. We have Christ in us all the time. So, Lord, we thank you for these things and for helping us to understand the greatness of creation and what happened in the beginning. And Help us to have a great week here, Lord, praising you and living for you and living in love with you and fulfilling the purpose of the ages, loving you and loving our fellow man. Help us uh, in that endeavor, Father. And again, thank you for today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.